Good morning. Good Chicles, the country church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Amen. Well, this morning, God seeks for a man. You ever hear people say, I was seeking the Lord? And I remember when I was seeking the Lord, when in reality, it's God seeking man. It's God looking for us. For example, all the way back in the book of Genesis, the third chapter, 8 and 9, and they, it's talking about Adam and Eve, heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where are you at, Adam? And it was God seeking him. Ezekiel 22:30. God says, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. The Lord says, I was seeking, I was searching for a man to stand in the gap, but there wasn't any out there. In Second Chronicles, the 16th chapter, the ninth verse, the Bible says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. So when God's people wouldn't listen to God's word, God told Jeremiah to act out the message. You know, prior to this, everything had been by word pictures. And we say a picture is worth a thousand words. And so God spoke to his people by word pictures, and they began to, or should be able to see themselves and to see their sin. But now God tells Jeremiah that he needs to act out his message. And I believe there's at least 10 action sermons in the book of Jeremiah. But in this chapter, God deals with four sins of the people of Jerusalem. And we can read of their sins and we can examine our own. Because that's what the Word of God is all about, isn't it? That we might be able to see ourselves in the mirror of God's Word. Now, the first six verses have the investigation. God said to go into the city and see if we can find a man. And here goes Jeremiah. He's in the city. And he's looking. But the people were ungodly. And he commanded Jeremiah to search through the whole city, all the way through it. And there was none righteous, no, not one. There wasn't any there. If Jeremiah could have found one righteous person, the Lord would have forgiven the wicked city and he would have called off the invasion. There wouldn't have been any Babylonian invasion. But God also made this agreement with Abraham. Remember the wicked city of San Francisco? I mean Sodom. <laughs> and God had this agreement and they went from 50. Abraham said, Lord, if there's 50 righteous people in the, in the city, Will you not destroy it? God said, I won't destroy it for 50. And he just went on down the scale until they got to 10. If you can find 10, I'll not destroy the city. 
Well, the test in Jerusalem was, does this person practice justice and truth? And he goes among the poor to find somebody that was qualified. But they didn't know the word of God, and they thought that if they didn't know the word of God, they were without excuse. We know that ignorance of the law is no excuse. Fair statement? At least that's what the officer told me <laughs> on the side of the road. So Jeremiah says, well, I'll go to the nobles and the leaders. And he finds that these guys knew the word of God. And this was the good news. He had found people that knew the word of God. But the bad news was that they rebelled against it. Notice what verse 5 of our text says. I'll get me unto the great men and will speak unto them. For they've known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Psalms 2, 1 through 3 describe it. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Listen, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now that's going to happen as we move toward what we call the end times. That's going to take place. But is it not taking place already that we're trying to shake the yoke? Anything that is smacks of Christianity is held to criticism. Well, when the survey was completed, they couldn't find one person who was honest and truthful. And the only thing left was to let the invaders in. The animal had gotten loose from the master, only to be met by a lion, a wolf, and a leopard. Now, what kind of freedom is that? I've gotten free from the Lord. Now all I've got to do is face a lion, a wolf, and a leopard. <laughs> Doesn't sound like freedom, does it? Well, sometimes we want to run from the Lord. The world's way sometimes is a lot more exciting than the Word's way. But then we find that the devil is a really cruel taskmaster. And we get more than what we bargained for. And that was the investigation that took place, looking for a man looking for someone to stand in the gap. But seven through nine talk about the condemnation. And uh, this would be a good one to bring out in the men's class or a ladies class, but I'm gonna bring it out in the whole class. How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods when I fed them to the full, they then committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlots' houses. They were as fed horses in the morning, every one neighed after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not visit for those things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? <clears throat> well, the bottom line is they were ungrateful. Ungrateful. I wonder, does that sound a little bit un, sound a little bit familiar? That they were ungrateful as a people. And God asked them two questions. One, why should I forgive you? You ever wonder about that? Lord, I'm thankful that you do. I'm thankful that you have. But why should? Why should he? When those of us who know to do good and do it not, the scripture says to us, it's sin. Shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods. <clears throat> when I fed them to the fullest, they then committed adultery 
and assemble themselves by troops in the harlot's houses. Secondly, he asks, Shall I not punish them for these things? Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? And shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? God says to them, <clears throat> and I believe certainly to us, and he said, I've supplied all your needs, and yet you've used your gifts for the world. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, he said, The goodness of God leads us to repentance. And it's interesting, there's a lot of people, a lot of preachers that try to preach people under conviction. Let me tell you something, if the goodness of the Lord won't do it, the preacher with a bony finger is not going to do it either. The goodness of the Lord ought to lead us to repentance. You ever think about how he's blessed you? Or instead, do you think about what you don't have and what you are called upon to bear? But the goodness of him leads us to repentance. Well, they were ungrateful for his blessings. Hosea speaks of them. He said, you've been made in the image of God, yet you've become as an animal in heat. Uncontrollable. That's what he says. They worshiped the world and Baal, and they gave the world credit for their prosperity. How sad. But it sounds so familiar. One of our couples visited a man that uh, had 640 acres towards Gonzales had a, over a 4,000 square foot house, had the place fenced and cross fenced. And the lady said, the Lord sure has blessed you. He said he wasn't the Lord, my own two hands. That's what blessed me. God help him, you know. Uh, well, giving the world credit for their prosperity. Every good gift comes from the Lord. You know, and we owe it at his hands. Verses 10 through 19 talk about the devastation. And here's the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter. The people were not only ungrateful, but they were unfaithful. And they, they didn't believe his word. And you know, when you don't believe it's his word, it's easy to turn your back on the Lord. And if you begin to question the word of God, or you begin to question the will of God, of God, or you begin to question the way of God, then pretty soon you take the place of God. And it's easy then to turn your back on the Lord. Well, that's what happened to the children of Israel. The scripture says they've lied about and denied the Lord by saying it's not he who speaks through his prophets. Evil's not going to come upon us, nor shall we see war or famine. You know, it's interesting, whenever we talk about the end times, whenever we talk about the return of the Lord, somebody will say, well, that's thousands of years down the road, you know. And they'll talk about what Peter talked about. He said there'll be people who say, where's the promise of his coming? For since our fathers fell asleep, we've heard this thing before, you know. And they began to question the word of God and the God of the word. In fact, some of them were just like you. They called the prophet's words just so much wind. <laughs> 
Was he wound up? Was he windy today? And they kind of just shook it off and made no application whatsoever. In Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter, verses 1 through 7, it says again, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for the watchman, if when he seeth the sword coming upon the land, he blows the trumpet, and warns the people, then whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any poor person from among them, he is taken away in his sin, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore shalt thou hear the word of my mouth <coughs> and warn them from me. Verse 11 says, God said, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why do you die, O house of Israel? Every service, every memorial, I try to call people to come to Christ. First and foremost is to see people saved. I don't have any desire to see people lost. I want to see them saved. <coughs> but secondly, <coughs> excuse me, I don't want their blood on my hands. And that's what the Lord through Ezekiel was saying. If I've put you up, if I've set you up as a witness, and you don't witness, then their blood will be required at your hands. Well, God called, and they didn't come, and they brought devastating judgment upon themselves. <clears throat> you ever heard somebody say that, well, if God is a loving God, why would he send people to hell? He doesn't send them. They go on their own. They walk through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to get there. Well, the scripture tells us in uh, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now, God said that his word would be a fire that would consume his people like wood. Wow. Verse 17. And they shall eat up or devour thine harvest and thy bread, which your sons and your daughters should eat. They'll eat up your flocks and your herds. They'll eat up your vines and your fig trees. They shall impoverish thy fenced cities wherein you trusted with a sword. In other words, they were pre-warned that the Babylonian invasion would consume the land and the people. The warning was there. But you know, there was also a promise that God would have a remnant. God always leaves himself a remnant. He says it over and over. One of the most powerful passages is Habakkuk 3 2. O oh Lord, I've heard your speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known 
in wrath, remember mercy. Isaiah said it. Micah said it. There's a remnant. There'll always be a remnant. The remnant that returned, restored the nation, rebuilt the temple, and maintained the testimony preparing the way of Messiah to come. God's always left himself with a witness. Well, the proclamation in verses 20 through 31 didn't give Mark a chance to read that, so you'll have to do that and on your own. He says, read the bulletin, and I say, read your Bible, read the last part of it. But they were unconcerned, and, you know, apathy and indifference is dangerous. It's dangerous around machinery if you don't know what you're doing. But it's even more dangerous, especially as it relates to the Word of God and the God of the Word. Now, Jeremiah was a kind of a shy guy. You know, and the, and the Lord never sent a hard man to deliver a hard message. He always broke the heart of the individual. We, the, we read about the lamentations. Uh, in other words, the weeping of the prophet. So Jeremiah was a kind of a shy guy, a shy guy, and yet God told him to announce boldly to them just what they were like. Now he should have had his bags packed after that because he angered them, but he didn't shake them out of their complacency. I mean, he dropped the hammer but he didn't move them a bit. He said really neat things like, you're foolish. You're senseless. You're blind and you're deaf. You're stubborn and rebellious. There's no fear of God before your eyes and you quit serving him. Now, that, how, how was that for his let's get acquainted message? Let's get to know one another. Well, we try and get the picture. All through the scriptures, we read about how all creation obeys the Lord. Think about that. You remember, it, it, uh, it made, caused the disciples to marvel. Because what kind of man is this that's able to do this? He walks on the water and he commands the storm to stop. He commands the winds and the waves to be still. And they do it like that. Well, I might have watched too much television as a young person. But any of you remember the old Tarzan movies? <clears throat> you want me to do my Tarzan? Yeah. <laughs> I can't. I lose my mind. <clears throat> I can beat my chest, though. Well, maybe I can't. <coughs> <laughs> they even called him Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. And when the enemy got too, too big, too great, He'd give his Tarzan cry, and all the animals would obey him. Remember that? Think of the God of all glory speaking, and 10,000 angels jump to do his bidding. Tarzan, my eye. Now, this same God bends down and whispers in your ear, come to Christ. The God who spoke the whole world into existence bends down and whispers in your ear, 
Come to Christ. Come to Christ. And you reject him? Does not equate, does not equate the God of all glory wants you to be saved. And you say, well, I don't understand it all. Or I need to learn more. Or maybe not today. And the God of all glory has taken the word and his Holy Spirit has dealt with our heart just exactly where we're at and sought to draw us to himself. And we reject him? How can this be? Well, instead of encouraging one another to fear the Lord, they, and to come to him, they exploited one another. That's what the scripture says in verse 31. And they loved it that way. That was their way. And they loved it that way. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Let me ask you a question. How does the end look to you? How does the end look to you? Do you know that you're saved? In other words, if anything happened to you, do you know without a shadow of a doubt that you'd be with the Lord? Why not settle that today? Because not tomorrow, not next week, but today is the day of salvation. And if you don't know him, you can bow the knees of your heart right here. Agree with God, Lord, I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. Would you come into my heart and life and save me? And on the authority of God's word, he'll do just that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And everybody that was saved, they followed him. The disciples dropped their nets and they followed the Lord Jesus. Nothing was more important than following him. Tax collector left his table. Zacchaeus climbed down from the tree. Nothing, nothing more important. Today, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, you can bow the knees of your heart right where you're at. Ask him to forgive you of sin, come into your heart and save you, and he'll do it. He'll do it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you're saved, you ought to have a desire to be identified with him. That baptismal pool has never saved anybody. But what it does is it identifies somebody as a saved person. In other words, I'm dead to my sin and I'm raised to walk in this new life that he's given me. I believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and I'm going to be identified with Christ. And maybe you're saved and identified, but you're not planted. We want you to know that you're welcome here. God's looking for someone. Is it you? Let's pray. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, strong as it is, straightforward as it is. The scripture said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And Father, we pray for people to be set free today by the power of the gospel. And as we stand here at the front to receive those that will come, to pray with them, to pray for them, 
to lift them up to you. Father, we pray that people will find Jesus sweet to their soul.